All right, hello everyone. Um, welcome to our talk. Today we're going to tell you how we moved our running OpenStack cloud into a new data center. Um, this is a big talk. This was a big project. Um, so some of the stuff you're going to talk about today is not super detailed. Like Craig and I would be happy to answer any questions you have about any, any part of this talk. Um, yeah, it's not advancing. Here we go. Okay, um, just a brief intro. I'm Matt Fisher. I'm a principal engineer at Time Warner Cable. This is with me today is Craig DeLatte. He's the lead engineer at Time Warner Cable. Um, here's some contact info if you want to get a hold of us later. Really brief background on our cloud, OpenStack Cloud. We run in two national data centers. We're looking at hundreds of nodes in each data center. It's a private cloud. We're running um, business critical applications internally for Time Warner Cable. So when you saw this talk, your first question is, why would anyone do this crazy idea? So the main reason is we are just out of space. Uh, we are out of compute capacity. We are out of storage capacity, especially for Ceph. And we had nowhere to plug new boxes into. Data center is full. So we had a new brand new data center literally across the street. Um, but we wanted to co-locate everything. So we decided to pack up the moving cloud um, and move it across the street. Second good reason is when we first stood up OpenStack, we had some environments, um, pieces of our environment shared between staging and production, specifically VLANs and um, hardware load balancers. So it made it kind of hard to make a change to one of those and um, know what was going to happen to production. Um, the third reason is in the new data center, we were going to be allowed to own the whole environment, including the network switches. Um, this will be important um, when we get to it later. Finally, we really needed to do a network redesign. Um, we needed to improve the resiliency if we lost a switch, for example, and we needed to get ready for some IPv6 work. So I want to set the difficulty level for our project. Um, these parameters are all different at different companies. The first thing is um, they don't let us in the data center. So any simple thing you might want to do, like move a cable, we have to file a ticket for. It goes into a ticketing system, and it gets put in a list, and then it gets done when it gets done. Um, secondly, we're not going to not allowed to touch the network switches in the current environment. This is going to be a recurring theme. Um, switch changes took days or weeks. Required someone to be up at 2 o'clock in the morning to see them through, and they were painful. Um, next, we're kind of a little special DevOps team at a large corporation, and so we don't use some of the tools the rest of the company uses, and that, that causes friction sometimes when we want to move fast and their systems don't allow us to. Like any big company, um, we also don't get to set anyone else's priority. So we file a ticket for the data center. We say, we need you to check this cable. It's super high priority. And every other ticket they've got is also super high priority for the team that filed it. And lastly, probably most importantly, um, our customers consider their VMs pets. I mean, seriously, pets, they should be created, and they should live for years and years and years, and you should never lose access to them. Um, this was probably the primary reason that we just didn't build a second cloud and tell people to move. What you're seeing here is our first technical planning session. Um, this is Vancouver out on the bal balcony, if anyone was there. Um, here we kind of finalized the network architecture. We came up with a list of to-do items, um, things to investigate. Um, and, and basically, as soon as we got back from this, we started on this project in the lab. Um, lab was finished in about a few weeks. And then there were some delays in there afterwards to get the production and staging hardware in, burned in, um, fought through some vendor issues, and then some holidays. Um, staging finally took place, our first staging environment, right before Thanksgiving. Production followed soon after. Um, and we all took a break for the holidays, came back, did our final staging production environments earlier this year. Our final, final change for this project landed in February. So you're looking at May to February, a long project. Great. Thanks, Matt. Um, so Matt covered the why we're moving. And you know, after we got to Vancouver, the mandate came down, hey, guys, we're going to do this. And so um, now knowing it's a reality, our, our first task was to figure out you know, what do we need to accomplish and what do we want to accomplish. And these are two big um, kind of sections which are condensed down. So basically, our need to accomplish is changing the whole network layout. Um, this allowed us to future-proof going into IPv6 and some other um, additional features. 
And then upgrading firmware. We fell way behind on firmware because, again, our customers' VMs are pets. They're not cattle. And then what we wanted to accomplish. Uh, we had a team member that really wanted to get um, burn-in testing to get all of our um, hardware issues kind of taken care of prior to ever being in production. And then also fix the server uh, hardware layout. This included changing NICs, uh, changing OSD to journal ratio on Ceph, and other various um, hardware components. OK, so the first part is the physical move. Um, so when are we realized like we had our whole order of when we're going to move our nodes? The first task is to evacuate the node, of course. Then at that point, it's wipe the boot drive. Um, we didn't want to risk anybody sitting there and saying, why is this off? Let's turn it back on. Next thing you know, it's hosting VMs, and then it gets powered down by DCS to actually move um, and take that outage. Um, the second step is to make sure that you check that you wipe the boot drive, because accidents do happen. At that point, um, we actually open our ticket with the instructions for our DCS team. They physically move the server, swap any hardware components, um, recable it. At that point, they power it on. It can't boot anymore. And um, we upgrade all the firmware, make, everything, make sure everything is standard across the board. And then we actually uh, do a cobbler update to allow it to boot and join the cluster and start hosting VMs. Now, um, we did run into hurdles. Uh, standing up infrastructure is very difficult in our environment. Again, uh, a lot of documentation, a lot of you're blind and can't go into the data center. Um, and then one of the things is firmware. So we have a bunch of different vendors, a, a bunch of different cards, a, a bunch of different stuff. So we had to start standardizing across the board of what different firmware versions we should be on. And then there's the hardware config. Again, standardization here makes everything easy. We can automate our builds. We can automate how things join the cluster and then burn-in testing. We found a bunch of issues with cabling. Um, we found bad dims. We had other motherboard issues. And burn-in testing is what really kind of sorted this out for us. OK, so this was um, the comment I made to management when I got um, assigned to do this task. So um, we have a really great story to automate servers and op OpenStack. I'm sure everyone here has that. But what about the rest? Because you, you can't just run OpenStack on a server. Um, you need other parts of your environment um, to also be automated. So um, we designed for this project. I mean, we didn't originally design for this project. But our design allowed us to do this project. Um, we have a full uh, node server build automation with Pixie, P Cobbler, and Puppet. So we just turn the box on, configure it in Cobbler. It comes up, joins the cluster. Everything's happy. We also invested a lot of time automating our hardware load balancer solution using Ansible. Um, this eliminated some manual steps, and I'll cover that here in a minute. Same with the network switches. I've already mentioned the pain of the network switch configuration, so we automated that also with Ansible. We also uh, designed some API quiescing with XINETD. This allows us to do a friendly sort of maintenance mode on API services so that we can power off the box after quiescing all the connections. We also spent a lot of time investigating, designing for, and tooling for guest VM live migration and also for virtual routers. OK, so let's dive in a little more. First, load balancers. Um, HA proxy for software load balancers, that's easy. Just use Puppet and it works great. But hardware load balancers without automations are super, super painful. So if I want to move a server and it has a new IP address, I have to call our ATN guy, Kevin, and say, hey, Kevin, I need you to log in to all the A10 boxes and change the IP addresses. And then the validation is something like, um, hey, the GUI is now a, a green dot instead of a red dot. With automation um, that Kevin and the rest of the team wrote, we now just do a deploy. And the deploy updates the A10. It does post-deploy validation. You know everything's good. The net result of this is not just speed. It means when we did some of this at 3 o'clock in the morning, Kevin could sleep, which I think he appreciated. Network switches was a huge win for us. Um, before automation, it required approval from three separate teams. One team wrote the config. They put it in a wiki. The other team took the config from the wiki, pasted it into the switch. Um, you're looking at days or weeks here, depending on where you're on the priority list. With the A10 system we have, we can deploy updates with Ansible and Jenkins. But better yet, we're doing all the switch config work in Garrett. So we want to move a box from one VLAN to the other. We propose it. The same original teams don't lose control. They still have plus two on it. It gets merged in, and then we deploy with Ansible. And getting the network engineering teams using Garrett was probably one of the bigger wins of this project. 
caveats. So um, you may buy a very expensive piece of hardware and find out that the API uh, in the documentation for the API might be lacking. Um, and if that's the case, you're probably also for sure lacking Ansible and Puppet. I believe we, um, we wrote our own Ansible modules for this project. And then if you go ask your vendor rep, um, we know how many bits you can push, what's your automation story, you're probably the first person that's ever asked them that before. Um, but the good news is vendor reps will usually buy you a beer if they can't answer your questions, so give it a shot. Okay, let's talk about the actual move. Before we started here, we had a goal. Let's not disrupt customers with this. Let's pretend it's a normal weekly deploy, which might cause a little bit of APIs to go up and down, and to them, let's just live migrate their VM, and let's hopefully not have anything else. I think we mostly met this goal um, with a couple exceptions, which Craig will go into later. The general process for a node is pretty simple. Um, drop the DNS TTL, we're gonna reuse the host name, so we need that lowered. Evacuate the node, if it's hosting VMs or routers, you gotta move those off. Um, if it's an API node, quiesce traffic. I'm gonna cover that on the next slide, I believe. Wipe the drive, as Craig mentioned, power off the box. Physically move it across the street to the other data center. I have a star here, because I um, was in charge of the control plane. I had a cheat code, and my cheat code was, I had new hardware in the new data center for the control plane, so I didn't have to move my stuff. Um, but compute and storage definitely were physically moving things. So anyway, um, update the DNS record to the new IP address, boot the box with Pixie, that's all automated. Test the new node, that's super important, I'll go into, into why later. Then um, once you know the node is good, update the load balancer config so it joins the cluster. If it's Nova Compute, um, re-enable Nova Compute uh, so that it can host VMs, and if it's Ceph, allow it to join the um, Ceph storage cluster. Okay, traffic quiescing, I probably mentioned three times already. Um, what is this? So we added a special health check port for all API services, including MySQL and Rabbit, so not just things like Cinder. Basically, you go to the box, you drop a file in the file system. This tells back to the load balancers, including the A10, um, in HA proxy, don't allow new API connections to this box. It's in maintenance mode. You then can go on those load balancers and watch and see connections fall off. And when the connections are clear, the box is now safe to either power off, move, reboot, whatever. Um, we actually eventually, initially designed this for deployments and regular maintenance, but it was super, super useful for this project. Okay. Actual nodes. So what? This was the order that we moved nodes in. Um, the first to go was Puppet Master, um, and the rest of the control plane um, storage kind of went in parallel once most of the control plane was done, and we kind of held compute to the end. And when we did this, we ran into a couple problems, which Craig's gonna cover. So our second move was more like this, um, storage first, and then the control plane, and then compute. And the point of this slide is not that this order applies to you, it's that your plans for this may change as you run through them and, and try, try new things. So we were pretty flexible with this. Okay, specifics. The first box to go, the Puppet Master, also the build server. It built our boxes, so we had to install this one off an ISO, um, kind of bootstrap it, and then we did what's called, basically, I call it a brain transplant. So we wrote a bunch of Ansible scripting, um, Ansible playbooks to um, to put it simply, tar up everything on the old Puppet Master that was Puppet related, push it across, and then switch the identities of the boxes. This meant we didn't have to redo any Puppet certs or any sort of that confusion. Um, the downside to this going first is that now we can't automatically pixie boot stuff in the old data center. So this was kind of like, we've crossed this bridge and we're not going back. Um, we did develop manual processes for doing that in an emergency, but we ended up not using them, which is good. HA proxy load balancers are next. So this is a simplified view of what it looked like. Everything's in the old data center. API calls come in, they hit a DNS record. The DNS record points to a VIP that one of the HA proxy pair is hosting. That proxies calls onto API services. So the first step here is we have this backup HA proxy node not doing anything. So it's going to be what we move. But the new data center has a new subnet. So we now have to have a new VIP. So step two kind of looks like this. So in step two, customers are still making API calls, old data center, but we have a new VIP running on the new HA proxy node, and we did extensive testing here. When we first did this, we found the new HA proxy node and the new VLAN couldn't talk to certain ports on API services. So we caught that in staging and got it fixed. Um, 
but that's why every step along the way here, we tested the new boxes before we integrated them back into our cloud. Next step, just simple. Just move the DNS record and everything should work. This is true for short-lived API calls, um, but it's not true for long-lived API calls, and by that I mean RabbitMQ connections from API services. Um, those connections basically stay around forever. We waited an entire day, and we didn't see the number of connections falling off that original VIP, and we have to move forward. So at that point, we powered off um, the first VIP. Um, if you're going to do this, you need to know how your cloud's going to react. We knew we had specific services that don't react well to their rabbit connection going away, even in 2016. Um, Designate and Heat were the two that stick out in my mind. Um, so we had Ansible scripting in place, basically, to bounce anything that didn't um, reconnect to rabbit at this step. Final states. Basically, the original state, except load balancers went first, so they're talking cross back, um, back across the cross data center link that we had, um, and load balancers were done at this point. Keystone was next. Um, Keystone boxes also host uh, Horizon. This was my favorite box to move because it was really easy and had no customer impact. Um, unlike other things like Rabbit, Keystone connections are very fast. So if you quiesce the traffic, uh, within two or three minutes, there's no more API calls in flight to the node. Once the traffic's clean off the box, you stop all the services, power it off, rebuild it across the street, and then you do testing. Another key thing here. So before you add this new box back to your API cluster, you need to make sure it works. The first box we did, um, all the tests pass, except it's on a new VLAN, can't talk to Active Directory. Go file a ticket, wait for that to get fixed, um, and make sure you haven't added to the cluster first or one-third of your API calls are now going to fail. Control nodes next, my least favorite thing to move. Um, control nodes at the time hosted virtual routers. Virtual routers are the most customer impactful part of this process. Um, we have customers that have one router with 40 FIPS. They have one router for their entire project. And when that router's offline, they lose every single VM and they tend to get mad. So um, this had to be done at night, but even then, I think we had more impact than we should have. Um, don't evacuate all the routers at once. Uh, we did this. It was a bad idea. Uh, we no longer do this. If you evacuate a node full of 100 routers, it takes Neutron and OVS a long time to rebuild all the routers and all the flows. You're looking at 10, 15 minutes in some cases. Um, the better way is to do them one at a time and check in between um, on, state, on sta status, and that's what we do now. Also, after this adventure, we no longer host routers on control nodes. Um, we have colleagues giving a talk on that tomorrow, um, I, th I think in the afternoon. Okay, so we got all the routers off the node. Now we're ready to deal with API services. API services are great, except RabbitMQ, again, um, we can quiesce connections on this node. You do occasionally have a, a, like a cinder or glance connection that lasts a long time. So after 10 minutes, we basically said, um, it's 2 o'clock in the morning, so I'm sorry, but I'm interrupting your API call. Listen in the maintenance window. But RabbitMQ is a special, special snowflake, of course. So the goal was to drop RabbitMQ connections off this node and move them to the other two. Um, so the first thing we did is we've already quiesced OpenSAC here, so let's stop it. But we still have OpenStack on other nodes talking to this node through HA proxy, so we've got to bounce them. And then we've got to bounce Nova Compute, which is a fairly harmless operation. And even then, you're still going to have connections inbound to Rabbit. Um, other things like OVS talk to Rabbit and don't restart OVS. So um, the one good thing is that OVS actually responds really well to Rabbit going away. It's one of the best behaved services in that respect. So you've done what you can to minimize the impact, stop Rabbit. Um, stop MySQL, see what blows up. You might have to restart stuff again. Um, heat, again, for some reason, like, likes to uh, not restart itself or not reconnect to Rabbit. Power it on the box, do all the same testing, make sure the Rabbit cluster is good, make sure the MySQL cluster is good, et cetera, then join it back to the cluster. Compute nodes. Um, the plan was pretty simple. Get as much spare hardware as you can in the new data center. Evacuate as many nodes as you can off the old data center to the new data center um, and repeat. Um, in practice, this took four days just because of the uh, um, amount of spare hardware we had and the amount of uh, number of nodes that could be physically moved and physically cabled, um, et cetera. We did invest a lot in our Ansible tooling for this. Uh, one of the things we do in our um, 
in our playbooks is we have a Canary VM. So the, before moving any customer workloads to a new machine, you put the Canary VM over there and you do a connectivity check. We have found that the um, tenant traffic on a new machine, maybe, maybe there's something misconfigured in the bond or on the switch and you can't talk into it. And you don't want to find out, you don't want to find that out with a customer VM, you want to find out with your VM. But live migration is not guaranteed to work, as anyone who's done it will tell you. Um, the first thing we found out is if you do a whole lot at once, it's a lot more likely to fail. And if you have 20 in flight and the fifth one fails, everything after that goes to error state. Um, I don't know if that's been fixed, but that was certainly true in Kilo. Um, so we basically limit our parallelization in this with Ansible. We started with one VM at a time. That took way too long, so I think we're up to five and it's been okay. But it might be something you want to tune based on your customers and your networks, et cetera. Finally, bigger and busier VMs may never live migrate, so that means you've got to call the customer and tell them um, we need you to basically shut down your box and do a cold migration. So that um, just adds a little bit of delay here. Okay. I'll Craig will tell you about storage. Okay, so what about all the storage? Uh, you know, we're using Ceph and Swift, and and we have all of our boot volumes on Ceph. And as you're moving stuff across, uh, you know, your two different environments, you're bound to run into issues. And we're going to talk through some of these. <coughs> all right, so Swift was the easiest part. Uh, we have a, a guy on our team doing uh, Puppet Swift work. And basically, the whole plan here is we wipe the boot drive, power it off, do not touch any other drives. Um, we physically move it, it powers on, Swift gets installed, it does its uh, you know, Swifty things and realizes it's all, you know, all these drives have object stores on them and actually just figures out what it needs to replicate. Um, the bad part of this is it does it all at once. So as you, if you bring up a node, it's gonna actually try and move data back and forth um, for all the uh, all the object stores. <laughs> okay, and the other issue we ran into is as we're building out our new control plane, we had different network ranges, so we actually had to do a lot of static routes, which included static routes across um, our WAN to our other data center. The most difficult piece was our Cephmon. Um, so, Whenever you're, uh, I mean, Ceph is reliant on Cephmon, if anybody here is not very familiar. Without that, Ceph just does not work. Um, so the first thing is, we knew the IP addresses were changing, um, and we didn't necessarily want our instances to have issues connecting to their drives. So we tried to virtualize the IP address. Ceph does not like this. Do not try that. Um, so basically, it says it's a security breach. I'm not going to, you know, validate this request, and basically, just, you know, you're again, you're kind of dead in the water. Um, so we came up with a with a, a plan, and we tested this through multiple scenarios. Um, the first is we actually have to do a Nova reboot, or I'm sorry, a Nova stop, or and start, or a Nova resize, or the equivalent of a, a Nova cold migration. So, and this is for the instance drive. Uh, Nova Live Migration does not update them. It keeps the same ones. Nova Reboot did not update them. So, th you know, it, you actually have to play with this process. I'm sure things get fixed as uh, Ceph keeps growing and, and Nova and all the other patches keep coming along. The other one is attached volumes. So with attached volumes, the, live mi or, um, the Nova Stop Start and Nova Resize didn't even touch them. So then you actually have to do a live migration in order to update those, which is easy enough because we got to migrate them from our old environment to our new environment. <coughs> okay, so for Ceph OSDs, this is a majority of our um, storage. So again, the plan here is we have to evacuate all the storage, you know, weigh out all the OSDs, and you have to do it in an orderly fashion. Um, so we were lucky enough to have, you know, a handful of nodes on the other side that we could actually bring up some new OSD nodes, slowly weigh them in, weigh the old ones out, and then just keep following that process as we're going through, um, making sure that you're removing the old nodes from the crush map and you're, and you're totally wiping it out because you want to be able to reuse some stuff and when it has new IP addresses, you don't want to confuse Ceph. Um, so then, you know, whenever we're done, we power off, physically move, pull it up, and just keep repeating in a slow pace. If you try and, like, you know, move it too fast, you're going to have some definite pain points. Um, as you will see, <laughs> in this graph, um, but people, I, let me try and, 
So over here, you see that we have a, a throughput of 20 gigabit, and we're maxed out at 10 gigabit. Um, so we kept going back to our network team saying, hey, there's a bottleneck. And they're saying, no, you have 40 gigabit on one side and 20 gigabit on the other. And after like three or four days of us saying it's a bottleneck on the, on the network, they said, oh, yeah, you're limited at 10 gig in between. So it kind of matches up. Um, so then we figured out how can we truly demonstrate this in a way that um, everybody's going to understand. And so we searched the Internet, and we found this. So this is your, all your services, your Ceph, your, your Swift, your Nova, and Rabbit. They're all fighting through that pipe. So as you keep exhausting this pipe, basically all your services are just going to stop, just start failing. So you really have to take a staged and careful approach to migrating your data. Okay, so there will be problems whenever you try and do this. <laughs> so to start going down a list of these problems, um, so with networking, ACLs, firewalls, um, as you're adding in new networks and removing old networks, you've got to make sure that everything is the same across the board. Um, and this is definitely difficult when you're navigating multiple network teams and, and everything else. Um, incorrect cabling. Again, two different qualities of service from different data center people. Um, some cabling was 100%, some was, you know, not 100%. And then bottlenecks, um, as demonstrated in the video or the little animation. So, and then with software, we ran into some VTEP issues, which I'm going to get into, and then we had a Keep Alive D problem, which I'm going to get into a little bit deeper. <laughs> okay. So, vendors. Um, we had a lot of different bugs with vendors, whether it be firmware, um, or, or just bugs in software. So our deployment process. <laughs> We're very strict with deployments. Um, whenever we deploy one region, we deploy to the next region, it's like one after the other. When we're doing this and we move that brain across to the new side, we actually ended up with one region on one deployment and the other region is still lagging behind. Um, and customers. Um, getting customer buy-in is definitely a hard thing to do. You have to have a reward for them going through and scheduling the downtime of their app, especially when it's a customer facing or a, a money making application. Okay, so with, with our vendors, um, our biggest problem was uh, firmware. We found issues with Pixie booting. We couldn't Pixie boot any of our boxes. This was a huge problem as you're trying to, you know, build out your new new side. Um, VLANs and LACP stuff. So we had bonding issues. Um, I think the VLAN issues that we, that we were facing that uh, really made life difficult um, in space. So not only did we have to build out new racks, we had to build out a new data hall, which was in a brand new data center, which we actually started building out as soon as we got occupancy. Okay, so one of the things is you have actual versus perceived issues, um, actual issues, the VTEP overlap. Basically, whenever we migrated um, our Nova compute over, we had VTEP two different VTEP in the same Nova compute zone uh, across two different like network settings. So we ended up with almost like a duplicate IP address thing. So your instance would all of a sudden intermittently just start, stop responding. Um, we accidentally upgraded OBS. And this goes back to that um, two different deployments across you know, our regions. And it, it gets kind of scary when you're running that, in that situation. Then you have uh, a file descriptor limit for uh, QMU. Basically on Ceph, it, re it needs a file descriptor for every OSD it's touching. And as you grow out your OSDs, you're actually gonna run into an issue where you can't even attach a volume to a, a running instance. And that's a, a, a big issue if you're running Ceph like we are. Uh, perceived. So we have a, a customer calls in, says, hey, we have high latency. It's, it's, it's your storage, it's your networking. And we're like, well, you know, it, it can't be. We're not showing any latency. And then it turns out they actually, you know, opened up a new ad campaign, which ended up with six million customers hitting an instance that wasn't necessarily, you know, scaled out for that. Okay, thanks. So um, if you're going to do something like this, if you're going to move to a new data center or, or a new data hall, um, what are things I think you ought to consider? First is um, our cloud has a lot of interdependencies, uh, services and whatnot, and I was um, in charge of developing this plan and I, I should have known better, but I forgot we were running caching DNS on the load balancers. 
So uh, the first time we did this in our lab, um, I said, hey, look, we moved the load balancers, everything's fine. And then every single Isinga check turned red because nobody could talk to DNS anymore. Um, so the plan was adjusted for that. And you may have little things like that that you've forgotten about. Um, you'll need to go remember what they are. Next, um, our plan relied heavily on basically reusing host names, but swapping IP addresses. There's things that we uh, still use IP addresses for. Uh, Galera MySQL config is one. Ceph uh, OSD or uh, MonMap is the other. And HEProxy is the third. And so anytime we wanted to change those in the middle of this process, we had to do a deploy to push out new IP information to the services. The other thing is um, you need to ask yourself what resources in your company are protected by VLAN specific ACLs. When we first stood up the new data center, uh, nobody could talk to the data center DNS servers and so uh, nothing worked. Um, that requires to file a ticket and a delay of several days. Um, I already mentioned, I think, the Keystone nodes not being able to talk to Active Directory. That was also a delay of several days. So if you have those enumerated and can test them beforehand, you'll save yourself some time. Um, another thing is, um, you need to have good maintenance plans in place for all your nodes and all in automation if possible. Um, this really helps um, in developing something like this. Next thing is um, don't over communicate with your customers. You need to tell them what you're doing, but they get really nervous if you tell them like your crazy plan for moving HA proxy. So you just tell them something like, we're doing this and it will improve uh, resiliency and scalability and, and Things like that, they like to hear those things. So um, that's what I recommend you tell them. <laughs> um, don't get aggressive with your timeline. If you're going to promise something to a senior VP and it's going to be on your annual goals, um, you might not hit it. And it might not be your fault because of all the sort of friction you're going to run into outside your team, even if you move fast. Um, so just be cautious. Practice, practice, practice. Um, that's uh, this is probably obvious. Um, the first time we did production was our third run through of doing this move. Uh, not our first. Every step along the way, we modified the plan. Um, we improved the plan in terms of reducing customer downtime and also in terms of making it faster, uh, especially for the parts of this that took place at 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning. OK. Um, this was a super long talk, and we touched on like a million things. So um, hopefully you guys took a little something out of this. Um, my key takeaways are probably that you know if your cloud's designed for maintenance and maintenance is planned in, then something like this is possible, um, moving a data center across the street. If you are going to do this, have good planning. Expect that um, different parts of your organization move at different speeds. Um, if possible, there's things you can do to work ahead. Uh, we had a, a problem one night with uh, control nodes not being able to move. We went ahead and moved other parts of the cloud, um, even though that wasn't the original plan. Finally, um, as I just mentioned, you need to practice this. Uh, you need to work out all the bugs in your plan and see, how you, see what all you can do to reduce customer impact. Um, and I do think we have a couple minutes for questions. There's mics in the middle. Yes. Uh, can you describe your Rabbit configuration? Do you running a cluster? Yes. Um, uh, we have a, th a three-node Rabbit cluster per region, and it's fronted by HA proxy. And I know. And, and it's not the Rabbit cluster. It's it's a Rabbit cluster. Are they connected or independent? The the Rabbit instances are they connected in cluster? Yes, they're clustered by Rabbit means. Yes. And it has persistent queue or no persistent queue. Durable. I'm not the rabbit guy, but we're running. Oh, the, okay. The, uh, the durable it's cues. usually the pain point. All stuff yeah. with rabbit, and you kind of skip it, almost. Yeah. So, and rabbit's interesting. There's a lot of opinions on not running it through HA proxy, um, but we actually found it worked better to go through HA proxy than to sort of do this. Um, what older versions of our code did, which was to specify every box in the config. Um, so on one of the slides, and I kind of missed it, um, so we had a KubeLiveD issue, and this was the biggest pain point with Rabbit and any, any of that stuff. Um, basically, KubeLiveD processes between our two HA proxy nodes got into a weird state, and we went split brain. So this caused Rabbit to basically say, I don't know, you know what I'm supposed to actually use. And, and, and so we're getting, like, uh, we run Cinder in a, uh, not HA, but in a, in, a, in a fashion that we're spreading across all of our control nodes. So different things like that get really confused. Um, but yeah, from, I mean, we're not doing any persistent queues that I'm aware of. I think 
our whole setting is HA durable, and as the service stops or dies, it goes away and builds a new one. So. Thank you. I have a two-part question here. Uh, you guys mentioned that there was a change in the network architecture, right? Could you touch upon a little bit on that? And uh, Craig would love to answer that. Okay. Um, so I, I'm actually a storage guy. I'm not a network guy, but. Um, so we went from an end of row to a top of rack. Um, so in every two racks, we had a switch pair, which, which um, basically were redundant of each other, and we cabled up to those. And then it went to a leaf spine situation. So again, it's kind of future-proofing against IPv6. Uh, we should be able to take down a, a rack pair or a rack in, in, in when we're doing switch upgrades and really not affect anything else. Um, so we're just building in a lot more resiliency. Okay. And you also mentioned that uh, due to the delay in the process of fixing networking, you guys had to take over the networking pieces. Um, um, I know it's an organizational question, but I'd like to know to what level you guys have taken over managing uh, the network infrastructure. Yeah, that's, um, so we definitely do all the network config through this automation thing I told you, and using Garrett and Jenkins and whatnot, but we um, politically cannot basically take over the other team's jobs. So the way it works for that is we want to change. Um, it requires three plus twos, one from each team who's got a say in it. And even though it's just an automation, it's literally a button press in Jenkins, it's done by another group. And that's way better than it was, but and that's about as good as we could get it. Cut down in like two weeks. Yeah, it, it, yeah. Uh, can you go a little bit deeper on the network architecture you had before the move and after the move, and if if that affected uh, live migrated instances that the network changed? The I didn't, I didn't quite get that. Live mi really so hard. once the instances were live migrated, if if they were affected by the network architecture being different, anyhow? No, I don't think so. Not not to my knowledge. Um, you want to answer? Um, so our, 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 the team that we have doing Neutron, they basically extended um, the old IP block across. So anything that already had a floating IP address automatically was still able to use it. Just really the physical layer is what changed a lot in how stuff was kind of being routed. But um, you know, for our end users, they didn't have to get a new FIP or anything like that. Um, and it also allowed us to actually add in additional like resources like floating IPs and, and other, other stuff. Yeah, I think. Um, a super big part of this was being able to keep the old floating IP block when we moved. Like without that, that's really disruptive. At that point, you may as well just tell people to go go use a new cloud or something. Okay. Thank you. Hi, you mentioned uh, hitting QEMU file descriptor limits for Ceph. Yes. Um, so I'm assuming that's on your compute nodes. Yes. That you're hitting that. Um, do you typically? How many VMs do you typically run on these where you were seeing those? Yeah. You know, is it hundreds? Is it 50? Is it? Um, so, I mean, it, it's, it's definitely a, a lot. So we have uh, a lot of compute nodes. I, I'm not going to get into the specific numbers. Sure. Um, I will tell you that it is based off the number of PGs, which are allocated per volume, and how many OSDs that, you know, all those PGs are spread across. And we didn't have this issue um, to begin with. And then we ran into this issue as soon as we were in the 800 to 900 OSD range. And we had a couple of people that were using like nine terabyte volumes and different things like that. So in whenever you start attaching more volumes, it opens up more, more sessions. So um, a lot of our customers do like just an instance. They don't necessarily do attached storage. So it's not bad. It's the ones that we're doing attached storage and then have five, you know, three to five, you know, attached volumes and they're big. Um, they saw the pain the worst. Okay, so it wasn't so much how yeah. many VMs you were running on your compute host. It was more. It's it's, uh, it's a libvirt setting, so it's 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 set to yeah, it's set to like a thousand twenty four, I believe, or something like that okay. in in the file, and you can you know. So you just tweaked that libvirt config yeah. and raised it up. Yeah, we use pr limit yeah. to troubleshoot those instances, just uh, you know, until we could get a change through Puppet. All right, cool. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Could you quickly describe your practice environment? Our practice environment. We have multiple. So um, we have a virtual development environment, which is um, I won't say I won't say what. It's not OpenStack on OpenStack, but it's literally our cloud configured and deployed our way, running in virtual machines. So that environment's for things like how do I move one puppet server to the other and not run into key issues and whatnot. Um, once we 
can't do anything anymore in there. We have a hardware development environment in the lab. Um, most everything in there is sort of just um, hardware to six, six compute nodes and a control plane. Um, then we have a staging environment. It's in, hosted in the actual data center. And this is the ones we can't get into. And so um, we would do that. It's a lot smaller than production in terms of uh, scale. It's like 100th scale. Um, but it was a way for us to practice the plan um, and figure out how we were going to monitor and monitor VMs and see what potential customer downtime we would have. Um, and then we go to production. At the time, um, we chose to do lab first, then one staging, then one production. And the thinking there was we still want to have one old sort of architecture staging environment in case we need to diagnose a problem there. Yeah, thanks.